Hello, welcome to my Summer Health Hacks Workshop. I'm Dr. Amanda Childress. I'm Holistic Pharmacist at the Nutritional Healing Center. Holistic Pharmacist, you may be wondering how does that work? Well, I'm a doctor of pharmacy, also known as a PharmD, but I haven't worked in conventional pharmacy in over 10 years now. I am now a holistic pharmacist as I have married my knowledge of anatomy and physiology, biochemistry, and pharmacology with my understanding of nutrition, supplementation, and natural health. As a holistic pharmacist, I am skilled at working with people who want to be healthy without a dependence on pharmaceuticals. But I'm also able to assist with individuals who are on medications, either with complementary nutritional programs, because many pharmaceuticals actually create nutritional depletions, and in many cases, with a safe plan to be able to heal enough to go off their medications. I became a pharmacist because as someone who has experienced a myriad of health issues and mysterious illnesses, and who comes from a family that battles autoimmune diseases, I always had the hope of better living through chemistry, as they say. I thought if you could find the right medication and the right chemical combination to throw into the mix and fix the imbalance, boom, you have health. We have the technology to fly through space and walk on the moon, right? Surely we can figure out the right mix of pharmaceuticals to help get people well. However, after working in the field of pharmacy for 10 years, seven as a technician and three as a licensed pharmacist, my bubble burst. As much as I loved seeing all my patients a lot, I started to see how they were becoming lifelong customers of the pharmaceutical industry with growing prescription regimens. I realized that the role I was playing by dispensing medications was primarily maintaining disease, not improving or healing it in the majority of cases. It's kind of like when you try to correct a pest situation. I don't know if you've ever seen areas where there's too many insects that are pests. I think usually it's aphids or something like that. And then there are really swarms of ladybugs. Ladybugs can be a great solution to other pests. Actually, there's been many releases like this by the government. And I think it's technically an Asian lady beetle, but forgive me if I imprecisely call them ladybugs. But if you grew up where I grew up, you know there can be an overcorrection and then the ladybugs become a problematic pest. I have memories of my mom spending hours going around the house with a vacuum and sucking up column after column of ladybugs off the walls after release just like that. If you're watching mom, please don't kill me. Okay, so these aren't dangerous, but they can sure be a nuisance and they don't smell very good either. So what if then to fix it, you get a bigger pest to eat the ladybugs, like frogs, for example. And then the same thing happens with the frogs. And then you have to get something to eat the frogs. So the cycle repeats over and over and the problem or the pest in this case gets bigger and bigger and harder to deal with. Your body is a delicate ecosystem. When you add chemicals into the mix, the same sort of situation can happen. You start a drug, you get side effects or other phenomena and need other drugs to handle that and it goes on and on and the spiral begins. And sometimes you end up with medical induced problems that are worse than the original condition. So now my motto is better living through biochemistry. Let's get the right nutrition in and get the beautiful self-correcting ecosystem of your body back in action. I'm excited to go over summer health hacks with you. As a pharmacist, I gave a lot of advice on what to take over the counter for various summer maladies. A lot of the OTC solutions can work, but often introduce toxicity and have the potential to create problems later. So now I get to give you the natural safe solutions to these problems so that you can begin building your natural medicine cabinet. So I'm gonna put up my PowerPoint here. So there we go. So here is summer health hacks. All right. So what I'm gonna be talking about is sunburn, poison ivy, bee stings, dehydration, allergies, and swimmer's ear. So sunburns. Sunburns are actually a radiation burn on the skin as a result of ultraviolet radiation exposure. The symptoms come from the immune response to DNA damage to skin cells. 
So sunburn prevention and sunscreen. So as you saw, this is actually a radiation burn. So when we're looking for good sunscreen, we're worried about effectiveness. You want to make sure you don't get burned and you want to you know, get the um, cancer prevention benefits. And allergenicity is actually a really big concern. A lot of sunscreens actually have highly allergy causing um, ingredients in them. And then toxicity. And from my viewpoint, this is the bigger concern here is the toxicity. So there's actually very little scrutiny that's been on it since 1970s. And in 2019, the FDA started to look into this a bit more. And studies show high rates of absorption in six out of eight of the most common ingredients used in sunscreens. So they can be found for the body for days and even weeks after use in high amounts. And they can be ingested. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you'll, you'll taste a little sunscreen as you're swimming or when you apply it, and they also get absorbed through the skin. So there's actually the potential for a lot of absorption. So I'm going to show you this, and I have a link on the bottom. Make sure you reference this link. But this table comes from the EWG.org. EWG stands for Environmental Working Group. I consider them one of the top um, places to gather information for sunscreen especially, but toxicity of other products as well. But if you look here, if you're looking at the FDA um, proposed classifications for safe and effective and potential for skin penetration, hormone disruption, skin allergy, and other concerns, most of your, oops, most of your um, most common ingredients here, um, these things at the top here, have a lot of concerns like they don't really fit the bill as safe and effective most they can all penetrate through the skin because these are chemical um, sunscreens versus barrier sunscreens so um and most of them have some allergy or other concerns there's one outlier here um, but for the most part we're looking at a lot of potential now, I really recommend that you take this link on the bottom and you look at this very comprehensive, um, what is this, explanation about sunscreens in general and current recommendations, because there are some studies, especially with this oxybenzone, where they found um, very concerning things like um, in a study in adolescent boys, they found a significantly lower testosterone level in the boys who used this. And they found a lot of these chemicals in very, very, very high levels in um, the bloodstream, in the skin, in urine, and in breast milk. So this can end up within the entire body. So now I think most of these products are still going to stay on the market but they have limited the percentage they're allowed to be. So they're going to be mixing and combining these. But, you know, the idea is that, well, skin cancers, you know, we know that that's dangerous. So we want to keep a lot of these products on the market. However, my viewpoint is why not go the safest route? Let's not wait until there's a huge body of evidence that this is a problem. I don't like the thought of something staying around in my body for a week after I use it and being in all my body fluids and bloodstream. So I'm gonna stick with the ones on the bottom. So the mineral sunscreens, these instead of absorbing and um, being a chemical sunscreen, they form a barrier. So these are called barrier sunscreens. Now these don't have the other concerns. Okay, you don't wanna inhale them, but most of them are in a dosage, uh, not a dosage form, but a form in which you wouldn't inhale them. Be careful with the sprays, don't spritz them over your face but really you should be using a cream sunscreen on your face instead of a spray anyway. So when it comes to sunscreen, potentially unsafe items can be parabens. I never recommend these in any sort of skincare or personal hygiene product. Oxybenzone, it's actually, and it may be a little different now since some of these new guidelines came out, but it's in about 40% of sunscreens, highly absorbed and an endocrine disruptor. So affecting the hormonal system. Um, so this one, you definitely wanna make sure you don't use. And then here are a few other, you know, the ones that start with O and the homosalate. I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce these. You're just best to stay away from those anyway.
Ava Benzone um, has a little bit of less of a concern if you really, really are sold on using a chemical based one. Um, but still, all these products are different and they change all the time. So make sure you consult with the yearly updated sunscreen guide from ewg.org because they're always going to give you the top rated as far as concerns about allergenicity or toxicity. Now, as far as safe, we've got mineral based or preferred. So the zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. So my preferred, the one we have in the office and just the one that has been the cleanest over the years is the Badger brand. The nice thing um, about the newer products is in the past, you know, it was like you were putting grease paint on and about to perform. Like you had, you looked very, very white. Um, now they have the clear zinc formulations. They go on pretty nicely. That's what I wear. I make sure that I use the Badger um, clear zinc on my face when I go out and it's been working really well. I used it at the beach, no problems, no burns. And then there's also um, the non-spray versions are safer because they don't have the alcohol and the propellants in them, um, less risk of spraying it, um, you know, inhaling it that way. But if you do use the spray versions, if you're really um, sold on the ease of those, then just make sure you use the cream-based ones on your face. And then you wanna get an SPF of 15 to 50. Just so you know, um, more isn't always better. After you hit about an SPF of 30, you're gonna get diminished returns in the higher SPF. The most important thing to do is to apply frequently. Um, so usually after, I mean, if you're really concerned about sunburn and prone to burning, I probably try to apply every 20 to 30 minutes, but you should be applying rather frequently and that's going to give you a lot more protection than a higher SPF. So we also have here at the Nutritional Healing Center, a sun protocol and the supplements I'm about to talk about um, our standard process and I'll be talking about standard process supplements a lot. Um, during the course of this workshop because um, we love standard process. We've used them for a very long time and I have great results with them, but they're what are called whole food supplements. So it's not just like you go out and you buy a calcium or a vitamin A. These are sourced from food. They're highly absorbable, very safe. And the magic in these products are not what's on the label, not the milligrams of vitamin but it's what's not on the label because it's the full complex. So the sun protocol, so this actually can help give you the nutrition needed so that your skin holds up better against the sun and that you heal and repair better. So I usually recommend five Cataplex F pearls per day. Um, so this has flax in it amongst other things and six to eight calcium lactate. Now, once you're getting, you do this usually a little bit before you start getting the increased sun exposure. And then once you're getting more sun exposure, let's say you're going to on a vacation and you're going boating or something like that. And usually you're gonna to increase to about eight cataplex F pearls and six to eight calcium lactate before bed. And usually I'll add more calcium lactate in if I got a little too much sun that day, um, just as some extra protection. And this will also help you um, with the vitamin D conversion as well. And then raw virgin coconut oil to the skin throughout the day, um, just to help keep the moisture in. There's a little bit of sun protection in coconut oil, but it's not enough. It's not gonna replace um, the, the sunscreen. So what do you do if you get burned? So there's lots of solutions out there. Pure aloe vera, you can actually get some decent ones. Just read the labels because often the aloe veras that you purchase are going to have a lot of other chemicals and the percentage of aloe vera is not going to be very high. I got a decent one. I think it was Alba brand, but just read and make sure there's not extra stuff or too much extra stuff in the label. And then spritzing with colloidal silver. My favorite is the ACS 200. I don't know if you've ever seen um, a big fat Greek wedding, but in that movie, the Greek father, um, his favorite home re remedy is Windex. So anytime there's an ache or a pain or any sort of problem, he spritzes it with Windex. The reason I bring that up is because ACS 200 is my Windex. I use it for everything. It's great for burns, cuts, bug bites, you know, you name it, it's good. 
So it's great to have that in your cabinet. I love this formulation because for one, they did, they provide the clinical data behind it. It shows activity against strep and staph, but also it's in um, a water base instead of an alcohol base, which means that you can use it pretty easily in very sensitive areas such as eyes. And <clears throat> I'll use this in my um, cat's eyes if she starts to get, you know, look like she's getting an eye infection and it wipes it out very quickly. And then there's USF ointment. This is from Standard Process. It's this really thick, greasy ointment, but it really puts the moisture back in. So, you know, if someone's burnt and blistered and it's open, don't put it on. But once it starts to heal, it's a really soothing, moisture adding barrier you can put on there. And then internal supplements to help expedite the healing process. So as I mentioned, the extra calcium lactate and cataplex F pearls, and then something called chlorophyll complex pearls. Um, and actually, I think they may have recently changed this and the cataplex F to soft gels instead of pearls, whatever. Um, but basically it's the green stuff in plants. So it's very healing to raw tissue. And then skin repair. So um, sometimes with burn and sun damage, you know, especially, um, you know, if you have some cosmetic concerns, but also just from a skin healing standpoint, you may want to put something topical on there. And these things can be helpful for longer term damage too. So we have something in the office called herbal face food. Um, so there's a lot of antioxidants in it. It's all food based. You apply it directly to the skin. And then there's also um, a cream called OxyCell, which has glutathione in it as well as many other factors that can really do wonders for helping to heal and repair the skin. So I'll have patients do that a lot um, from sun damaged areas. So next topic, swimmer's ear. So if you love swimming or you have kids that love to swim, um, this can definitely be a problem. Um, and so let's define what it is. It's an infection in the outer ear caused by pathogens and triggered by a warm, wet environment in the ear. Okay, so you get water trapped in there and you can set up an infection. It is definitely more common in children and frequent in swimmers and people with history of ear trauma. Okay, so if you have a kid that used to have a lot of ear infections or if you have a history where you used to have tubes as a kid in your ears, you may be extra prone to this. You can also trigger this by overzealous wax removal. So keep the Q-tips out of your ears and you know don't go overboard because the wax actually has a protective um, mechanism. So you want to have a little wax in there um, just to help protect your ear. And swimmer's ear is also very, very painful. So solutions for swimmer's ear, as I mentioned before, keep the Q-tips out of your ears, please. And then release as much water as possible after swimming. So if you still feel a little something in there, make sure you give it a little shake. You know, get out as much as you can, lay on your side. Um, so, you know, stopping it before it starts is always the easier way. And then use, you can use a one-to-one -one mixture of white vinegar and rubbing alcohol in the ears. So, so, you know, you just lay there with it on your side for a while and then let it drain out. And that can often help to dry up that moisture. Um, a lot of the swimmer's ear products that you buy are primarily just alcohol. So you can save yourself money with things you have at home. Now, you can also soothe it with lukewarm extra virgin olive oil. And if you've ever um, seen or heard of people using sweet oil in their ear, um, that's actually just a really pure version of olive oil. And then avoid sugar and food allergens. Okay, so when you are eating a diet very high in sugar or foods that um, you're allergic to, this can often increase your potential for getting this. Um, because it can keep some inflammation going in there too. So, you know, people who get a lot of ear problems, that's always an area I'm going to look at. And then supplements I like for this. So there's a supplement called Antronex. Think of that like your natural antihistamine. Anything you would use a Benetrol or a Claritin for, you can use Antronex. And it also has, it's not just a Band-Aid, it has immune system benefits too. Same with Conjaplex. Think of congelic congestion. Um, so this has really good antibacterial properties as well as help for the congestion. And then an eardrop called CXACX drops. 
This is from a company called Systemic Formulas. It can go right into the ear and deliver um, healing factors. So the next topic I want to cover is poison ivy. This will translate to poison oak, poison sumac, all those good topical poisons there. So poison ivy features. So a poison ivy rash is an allergic reaction to the oil on the plant. So again, we're going to be talking about immune system factors here. So you get small blisters, usually in patterns of lines or clusters of the blisters. So you can contract it from touching the plant directly or indirectly or even from smoke from burning it. The worst case of poison ivy I ever had was actually um, when I was getting ready to go to college, I had a yard sale with my friend outside and we were nowhere near any sort of weeds, but there was um, a farmer burning off some land and then we both contracted the worst poison ivy. I had it all over my back areas that weren't even exposed. Um, so you can definitely get it that way. And then um, upon exposure, one of the best things to do is to clean the area thoroughly and wash your clothes or anything that came into contact. So you can actually get it at a later date if you come in contact with um, the oil on a clothing item. So make sure you're really diligent about doing that. So poison IV supplements. So again, we're going to work on this like an immune challenge. So there's a supplement called Immuplex from Standard Process, which is usually used for viral situations, um, but it's really great for poison ivy. Usually an adult, I would recommend for a day. Cal Ammo, another standard process, very, very good for skin conditions. And usually it's three to five per day. This is also very good for allergies. Antronex, six per day. Acia Silver, 200, that's that colloidal silver. This can be phenomenal for things like poison ivy. So you can spritz it on often and when it starts to itch, even a little spritz can help that. And Spanish black radish, six per day. It can be more in some people, but um, the nice thing about these two, because they're whole food nutrition, it's not just like you're treating the symptom. You might accidentally get healthier <laughs> while you're doing it too. So Spanish black radish, think of this like a toxin absorber at the level of the liver. So it's, it's really nice and cleaning and immune system supporting. You can also make a paste. So especially if it's very, very um, weepy, you can make a paste with some bentonite clay, which you can get very easily a good quality bentonite clay from Amazon or health food stores and mix some silver. If you don't have silver, you can just do some water and that will help dry it quicker and help with the itch. Bee stings. All right, that's fun. So with bee stings, first of all, you wanna remove the stinger if it's still there. Sometimes they leave it behind. Wash the sting area and then apply a paste of baking soda and water or you can use apple cider vinegar, um, you know, soak a pad in it, apply it to the steam for 15 minutes. That will help neutralize um, the venom. And I actually have a memory of being at an outdoor church service um, with my family. And then I just randomly got stung with a yellow jacket, which I'm a bit allergic to. And then my um, aunt Justine, my great aunt, comes up to me and just has vinegar with her and just throws it on a paper towel on me. I was like, great. Now I have a steam. It hurts and I smell bad. But actually, Aunt Justine knew what she was doing. So <laughs> you can apply an ice pack with cool compress because it's going to get really inflamed. And then again, you can do that bentonite clay paste. So this will help to draw and help with the itch. Um, also supplements, if it's really itchy or swelly or red, this is when you can again use the Antronex Spanish Black Radish and Cal Ammo. Starting to see a theme here. A lot of these are gonna cover many, many issues. So summer allergies. And actually this is going to translate to summer colds as well. So some of my favorites, again, we've got that Cal Ammo the Antronex and the Spanish black radish. Also, if you're really prone to allergies, you should get an air purifier with a HEPA filter in it. 
Um, you can get some fairly affordably, and often it's good to put it in the space that you're spending a lot of time in or in the room that you're sleeping. And if you have a chronic issue with allergies, then there's more healing to do. Um, you may need some gut healing or liver support. So that's when you'd be a really good candidate for a bigger program because allergies usually don't originate in the sinus alone unless you've got an infection that's hanging out there that the immune system can't get to. And in that case, you could use some help with that too. Dehydration. My goodness, in the summer, this is a very, very big deal, um, especially in like here in Michigan, you may not get the idea if you're not from here that it's very hot, but in the summer, it can get very, very humid. People can get dehydrated pretty easily without realizing it. So symptoms of dehydration, you get headaches, dizziness, lightheadedness, muscle cramps or spasms, swelling, Believe it or not, not having enough water can actually make your tissues float out. Fatigue and chest discomfort or chest pain, or even feeling like you have a racing heart. So I actually see a lot of people um, who have very concerning symptoms like this, and they don't put it together. And really, it's just a more chronic level of dehydration. So this is always an area to pay attention to first, if you have these things going on, because something that can look like a very, very serious condition can actually have a really simple solution. So solutions to dehydration. So increase your water intake. You're gonna need more water if you are exerting yourself or it's very, very hot and highly humid. So if you're sweating a whole lot, um, you may also need more on days where maybe the fluid um, content of your food isn't very high. So if you're not eating you know, fresh fruit and vegetables, or, you know, people who are on a keto diet, often they have to pay extra close attention to their hydration status. And um, also, if you drink a lot of caffeine, think of that like negative water intake when you consume that. So one really easy solution that many of you have in your kitchen already is a good quality salt because you're going to lose a lot of that salt when you sweat. So um, I recommend the Celtic sea salt and the pink Himalayan salt. Um, I really like the Celtic sea salt brand and not that I'm paid to endorse them or anything like that, but you know, they have quality standards and they actually produce some reports of their mineral diversity and cleanliness on a regular basis. So that's really important. Not all of these sea salts are created equally. And also if you notice, if you go just to like the store and pick up just a generic sea salt, often it looks really powdery and dry and uniform and very, very white. That's usually not your best salt. If there's a high mineral content, usually your salt's gonna look a little off color, like maybe beige or gray. Um, and it's going to look a little damp because it's gonna draw a lot of moisture to it. So electrolyte powders, um, these can be helpful too if you have a particularly high electrolyte need, you wanna keep things balance like your sodium and potassium. Those two have to be in a very close balance. So um, make sure that your electrolyte powder does not have sugar or artificial sweetener. I see patients make a mistake with their electrolyte powders very, very often because, you know, they don't really look at the other ingredients. Often there's sucralose in there, which I don't recommend, or, you know, just way too much sugar. So there are many good ones on the market, but be careful. I usually recommend just sticking with a good quality salt because you know it's going to have a lot of other minerals in it rather than just the sodium to keep things balanced and it's easy and you have it. But some people don't like that or they need more. They're still very dehydrated. So this is where I recommend something like Dr. Berg's electrolyte powder. It tastes good and it has a lot of potassium in it. And you know, most powders and supplements don't have quite enough potassium for people who are truly dehydrated. All right, so that was pretty short and sweet, um, but that is your crash course in your summer um, medicine cabinet. I hope that was helpful for you. And if you have further questions or need help with your health, give me a call at the office. Thank you so much.